Um, there's people still joining, but um, I think we'll make a start if that's okay, so that we can uh, keep to time. Um, just like to say thank you to everyone for joining this session as part of Falls Prevention Week. Um, this session's time to feel good about ageing and the link with frailty and falls. So it's a want to know more about falls um, session. So I'm Sharon Hughes. Um, I'm falls project manager with Leeds City Council based in the public health team. And we've got Joe. Do you want to introduce yourself, Joe? Hi, I'm Jo Brayshaw. I'm Clinical Falls Specialist in Physio for the Community Falls Service, which sits within Leeds Community Healthcare NHS Trust. Okay, thanks, Jo. Um, so we've opened this session up um, to a regional event as part of the Regional Falls Prevention Week. Um, and the theme for, for Falls Prevention Week this year is time to feel good about ageing, um, given all of the negativity that we've had um, this year. We felt it, it was a good idea to try and promote um, things in a more positive light. And the session's aimed to just give you some more information regarding falls, how to identify some of the risks of falls, um, and what can be done to try and support people who are at high risk of falling. So if we go into the first slide. <clears throat> so a lot of work's been done regarding frailty, um, and what we're trying to do is change the perceptions of people regarding what frailty is. Frailty has various definitions, um, two that we've picked out here are um, frailty being a state of increased vulnerability resulting from ageing associated with the decline of the body's physical and psychological reserves. Um, and second one, which is um, effectiveness matters, is the distinctive state where a minor event can trigger major changes in health from which a pa patient may fail to return to their pre previous level of health. health sorry. Um, so I think that's really well explained in this next slide, um, which, which is called the frailty fulcrum. And um, apologies for those who have already seen this, but I think the frailty fulcrum video, which you've got the link um, to, to access it there, um, thinking about frailty, it's talking about there's various components that make up um, support for an individual. So it's the systems of care around them, um, their physical environment, their social environment, their psychological status and any long-term conditions um, that they're living with. And frailty isn't just end of life and for older, referencing older people, actually. Um, people that are younger but living with multiple long-term conditions um, can be classified as being frail, looking at the electronic frailty index. Um, so acute health health events can um, impact more significantly on people that are living with frailty. And there's various levels of frailty from mild to moderate and then severe frailty. So when we talk about frailty in that context, severe frailty is end of life. But as I say, generally talking about frailty, it's not talking about just end of life. It's talking about across the life course. And lots of things can be done to, to support people to prevent them entering into, into that severe frailty spectrum um, that, that we can do proactively. So we've gone to the next slide. There's various components um, that make up frailty, the frailty syndromes, and falls is one of those syndromes. So um, falls can be caused by immobility, delirium, um, incontinence can impact, um, and susceptibility to side effects of medication. And all of those components together obviously indicate the level of, of risk somebody may have. Um, or actually the impact of what a fall um, on an individual. If we move to the next slide. So why are falls important and what are falls classified as in this context that we're talking about today? So a fall may be defined as an event when a person unintentionally comes to rest on the ground or other lower surface. So a fall might not necessarily be um, a, a fall from something. It could be somebody slipping from a chair. Um, it could be somebody physically tripping over something or falling over or going dizzy when they stand um, or get up from a lying position. 
We know that one in three people aged 65 or over will fall each year. Um, as people get older, that, um, that figure goes up. Um, and what we're finding is, as a result of deconditioning from COVID, um, we've seen a lot more people that have um, lost muscle mass um, and falls risks are increasing. And we're seeing an increase in falls nationwide um, after the, the isolating that people have been doing. Um, there were 21,140 emergency hospital admissions due to falls to people aged over 65 in Yorkshire and Humber in 1819. And the estimated cost um, to health and social care just from hip fractures is six million um, per day or 2.3 billion per year. Um, and that's not thinking about the number of people that are ad uh, admitted to hospital with um, a serious injurious fall. That is just the hip fracture figure. And we know generally that when people experience a hip fla fracture, it isn't their first fall. Um, it's usually their third or fourth fall. Um, so that hence the, the need for us to identify the risk much earlier and consider what we can do um, and, and support people to prevent um, falls. I'm going to hand over to Jo now for the next slide. Okay, so as we've mentioned, falls is one of the frailty syndromes and it's often one of the first signs of frailty. So as we've touched on in, in relation to the financial cost of falls, one of the most important things to think about is the personal cost of falls to older people um, and how that impacts on their quality of life. So looking at this slide, it's just describing what can happen to somebody after they've had a fall. So quite often they can be quite anxious and worried about falling again, which in turn can affect their confidence. Um, they tend to limit their activity levels and can be, potentially become less dependent with day-to-day -day activities. Mobility can reduce, deconditioning can come into that because they're not doing as much as they were before. They tend to become quite socially isolated because they've restricted their activities and they're not going out. And in turn can lead to somebody becoming quite depressed, then resulting in kind of not eating and drinking as well. They can become dehydrated um, and that in turn can lead somebody to feel dizzy. They can become confused and ultimately that can lead to a further fall. Um, and depending on the outcome of that fall will determine what happens to that person. So they may well be able to continue to manage at home. Some people may need extra support. Some people may end up in long term care because they can no longer manage at home. And for some where there's significant injury or harm from the fall, um, some people do die as a result of a fall. So it's really important to stress why we need to assess these people as early on as possible and intervene with what, what we can to try and reduce the risk of the falls happening in the first place. Next slide, please. So looking at how frailty impacts on falls, so there's quite some common issues that are identified in frailty that have also been identified as risk factors for falls. So in particular, when we look at medication, so polypharmacy, if somebody's taking four or more different medications, um, loss of muscle mass and function, which can link in with physical active inactivity and reduced mobility. And certainly more of an issue as we've come out of um, lockdown where people are going to be more deconditioned. Um, anyone with continence issues, visual problems, cognitive impairment and also excess alcohol comes into that as well. Next slide, please. So specifically falls risk factors. Um, where someone's had a history of falls already, they are more at risk of having further falls. Um, Environmental hazards, so hazards around the home, most of the falls that do occur with older people tend to be in the home environment, so it's important to look at that environment as to what we can do to reduce that risk. There's certain medical issues, so such as postural hypotension, so that's where someone's blood pressure will drop when they stand up uh, and they may feel dizzy with that. Or there may be more acute issues, such as an infection like a UTI that might be causing the problem. Certain conditions such as Parkinson's disease, there might be somebody that's had a stroke, um, so neurological conditions that can affect muscle strength and balance and general movement increase the risk of falling. Um, but also conditions like diabetes, uh, which can affect the lower limb sensation, so if somebody can't feel their feet as well, um, that's also going to affect the balance and make them more unsteady and at risk of falling. We've talked about polypharmacy, but it's also certain medications make people more at risk of falling, as well as the number of medications. 
Um, muscle weakness, balance and mobility impairment is quite a known risk factor there, but also a modifiable one. So it's something that we can intervene to look at addressing. In relation to cognitive impairment, so that would be looking at if someone's got memory problems, they might not appreciate the risks um, around falls. They might not remember the safety advice in terms of what to do and not to do. Continence issues um, and visual impairment as well. If, if someone's vision is affected, that can affect their balance as well. Next slide, please. So where we look at in terms of risk assessment, um, a multifactorial falls risk assessment is looking at identifying what individual falls risk factors there are for that person. Um, this slide just highlights what nice the nice guidance considered to be to be the elements that might be included. Um, as part of a multifactorial falls risk assessment. I think it's important to say, though, that the assessment needs to be completed kind of within the sphere, sphere of competency and skills um, of the person. So what somebody's trained to do. So there'll be elements that people can do, but other elements where you might need to refer on if it's out of your remit. So when we look at falls history, it's important to look at how many falls the person had in the last 12 months, where those falls have happened, what the person was doing at the time. Is there a medical or physical underlying cause that, that we can address? Um, when we're looking at osteoporosis risk, is the person taking bone protection medication because they already have a diagnosis? Are they taking the medication they should be? Or is it someone that is at risk of fracturing as a result of a fall? So do we need to flag that up to the relevant professional to, to look at further assessment? Assessment of visual impairment, so we touched on that on the previous slide in terms of how that impact can impact on someone's balance um, and also continence. When we look at cardiovascular examination and medication review, so that would obviously be the relevant professional that's trained to do that if there was an identified underlying medical issue or where medication might be deemed um, a risk factor for the falls in that individual's case. Home hazards, we've also touched on there in terms of looking at that environment. Assessment of cognitive impairment and neurological examination. So again, it's identifying the relevant professional to be able to assess that. An assessment of older persons perceived functional ability and fear of falling. So what does the person feel that they can and can't do? What are they worried about doing? It's about bringing back that confidence, um, which can be really effective when someone's had a fall or is just worried about falling, um, the risk that's there. So that might be involving other professionals, such as an occupational therapist. And then the assessment of gait balance and mobility and muscle weakness. So that's identifying where exercise may play a part. Um, and again, that back referring on to a physio or relevant exercise professional to look at what might be appropriate to, to provide. I think that it's important to say as well that obviously across the West Yorkshire footprint, we will be looking at different falls pathways that will be in the different areas. So it's probably important to tap into the services and the pathways within your individual areas because it will be different in terms of what services offer what assessments and what the referral pathway is for that next slide please so when we look at interventions in a very general sense we've done a multifactorial falls risk assessment so then it's looking at multifactorial in terms of interventions so based on what those individual risk factors have been identified for that person what that person's needs are it's looking at that individualised approach, um, patient-centred approach, so very much about goal setting with the patient. So looking at what they want to achieve, which is more likely to improve kind of adherence and compliance with interventions and certainly in relation to things like exercise. When we look at multidisciplinary and holistic approach, that's obviously bringing in different professionals, um, health and social care professionals, leisure services depending on what issues are identified there um, and obviously but we're still looking at the person holistically and evidence-based obviously we want to provide interventions that have been proven to be effective in reducing the risk of falling um, and also to be proactive so quite often services are reacting to somebody that's had a fall already but it doesn't stop us being proactive in terms of preventing further falls so it's very much important to be looking at the education that we provide on false risk to the person that makes it individual and how they can potentially self-manage their risk going forward in the long term for the future. Next slide, please. So when we look at the benefits of exercise and physical activity, this plays a really important role um, in optimising and maintaining someone's health and well-being. 
So this slide just identifies some of the benefits, certainly not all, because um, there's obviously a much more extensive list there. But in relation to falls and frailty, we're really wanting to improve someone's strength and balance. Um, the benefits could come in around strengthening bones, so improving bone density, um, reducing risk of falls, where we're promoting cognitive health, so really looking at improving mental health and well-being and bringing that confidence in again to trying to improve confidence in relation to activities of day-to-day -day activities. Um, and it can also help to reduce the risk of heart disease and improve sleep, so that overall um, health and well-being aspect. Next slide, please. So this hopefully is a slide that most people will be familiar with. So looking at the physical activity guidelines. So again, building on the strength aspect. So it's encouraging um, elements of strength exercise on at least two days a week. Um, again, improving balance two days a week, trying to just really reduce the risk um, of somebody spending a lot of time sitting down and not, not getting up and exercising. Um, so obviously it's trying to encourage that activity different activities that can come into play with that um, that will also support that um, physical activity, but trying to encourage at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity per week um, or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity. And again, that's going to be very individual depending on that person um, and what their medical and physical needs are. Next slide, please. So focusing a little bit more on the exercise component. So when we talk about evidence-based exercise, strength and balance exercise has the most evidence around it. So that can reduce the risk of further, or further falls. But the two main evidence-based exercise programs that will be familiar to some are uh, the Otago Exercise Programme and FAME, so Falls Management Exercise, which is based on Postural Stability Instructor Programme. So the Otago Exercise Programme is a home-based exercise programme, uh, whereas the FAME programme is a group exercise programme. Again, it will differ in terms of what's available in your different areas. Um, and it's very much emphasising the importance of pre-exercise assessment because we need to make sure that people are safe and appropriate to exercise, that we're considering what medical issues, what physical issues those people have so that we can make sure that they are signposted into the right exercise programmes to meet their needs. The benefits of obviously group exercise over, over home exercise are that it, there's that motivation, you've got people around you, the peer support. Um, but having said that, with the current situation with COVID, we do appreciate that that is quite limited at, at present. So it's trying to keep encouraging people to be as mobile as possible so they are avoiding sitting for long periods, engaging in functional activities, so linking in with the physical activity guidelines in terms of what activities they can still do to try and keep that, the levels of physical activity up um, and, and where able it's that social interaction within the limitations that we have at the moment. Next slide please. So looking at the impact of COVID and lockdown so as we've mentioned earlier and looking at how we talked about the impact of falls on older people and where deconditioning comes in there in terms of that vicious circle and almost that spiral of decline once a fall has occurred. Um, we've all got the added complication of lockdown that we've had as a result of COVID um, and further deconditioning for these people that are already at risk of falling. So it's likely to lead to an increased risk of falls and certainly going into winter, that's obviously a concern we have. The other impact is the social isolation and the increasing anxiety that people are having. They've not been out much or at all, so they've got lost their confidence to go outside and it's how we can build that back up. Obviously our challenge at the moment is how we pro provide face-to-face -face exercise for COVID. Um, so we obviously need to look at how we can adapt to current circumstances and where digital technology will play a part. Um, but obviously we need to acknowledge the risk with virtual delivery of exercise programmes to make sure that we are again providing safe exercise but whilst we're also trying to maintain evidence-based exercise and again digital technology will depend on that individual person and what's safe and appropriate for them. Um, for those of you that are familiar and work with the Otago programmes or PSI, um, the FAME programmes, if you haven't already seen it a good resource to look at in relation to this is the Lead to Life guidance that came out in August um, in response to COVID, so it looks at the delivery of virtual fame in Otago, um, so it just gives a bit more information on, on 
and direction and support on where to go with that so that we are trying to maintain as optimum as we can in terms of provision of exercise programmes for these people. Okay, and I'm going to hand back to Sharon now. So just before we go on to this next slide, just to reiterate um, what we have across the region, um, the West Yorkshire region and beyond, um, we have a falls um, network, so we are sharing good practice and sharing information across areas of the learning that we've got in falls prevention, particularly around COVID to try and come up with um, alternative approaches to, to support people through, through this challenging time. So this resource that I'm going to show you now is Staying Steady in the Home um, and it's actually a resource that Wakefield um, produced um, to prevent falls and it's, it's freely available from Wakefield. We have similar types of things across all the parts of the region on your local services. So it's really prompts um, of, of things that you can either encourage an individual to, to sort of consider or even things that can be considered whilst um, doing home visits or having contact with, with people that are at high risk of falls. Um, so thinking about the clutter that might be in the rooms, um, making sure that people have had a, a meds review, um, and there's, there's interventions, so steps and stairs free of clutter, stairs being well lit, um, making sure that grab rails and handrails um, are recommended to individuals um, and trying to encourage people to be more proactive rather than waiting till um, that they become more immobile um, and then getting aids and adaptations. It's that, that thought of trying to be more proactive in the approach. Um, Thinking about the kitchens um, as, as people age, are things accessible? Are they able to reach up to to access things, or is it actually are they having to stand on things to, to access um, the bathroom, um, grab rails, um, and non-slip mats? Um, in, in the living room, making sure again that the big one here is is around the clutter, making sure that there aren't trip hazards around the home, um, because we know that as as Joe's mentioned, a lot of the the falls that we see are actually around the home, um, and and it's not just the winter months when it's icy or cold or slippy. Um, we we tend to see a trend with with falls across the the full twelve months of the year. Um, in the bedroom, one of the things, thinking about the postural um, drop, the, the postural hypertension, making sure people have got a light close to the bed and when they get up from the bed, um, during an, uh, if they have to get up to go to the toilet on, in the night, encouraging doing that slowly and doing it in stages rather than standing straight up from a lying position, which can cause a lot of falls. Um, and then some information on what to do if people have a fall. Now, with the PSI instruction programmes, we, one of the big things that is, is taught within those programmes is how to get back up um, if, if people have a fall and um, the backward chain in, because a lot of the issues that we find and the calls to the ambulance service and admissions to hospital are because people have fallen and they've been laid on the floor for quite a long time because they're unable to get back up. So that goes goes back to what we were saying about the physical activity and I think the thing to reiterate with the, um, the, the Chief Medical Officer's guidance on physical activity, we need to be encouraging everybody across the life course to work on strength and balance um, rather than waiting to, till people are experiencing muscle deterioration um, because that will prevent falls um, later on in life. Next slide please. Um, so again, this is another useful tool that, that can be accessed um, just as a bit of a prompt for people. It takes you through the different rooms of the house and things to look out for in terms of hazards that might be there that will be um, things that can be done to, to prevent falls going forward. Um, the big one on this one is as well the, the eyesight um, depth perception for people as they age um, reduces. So so some falls, missing steps as, as people are climbing stairs and things. So having that regular eye test is, is crucial. Similarly with hearing tests, um, a lot of hearing impairments can result in loss of balance um, and falls. So again, encouraging people to have hearing tests annually and regularly. 
lighting um this is where some of the partnership work comes in and um, thinking about the fire service and the safe and well visits that they do and opportunistic visits to properties and, and speaking to individuals um come into play having conversations are they able to change the light bulb or is it that a light bulb's gone and they can't change it how how do we provide support for things like that to make sure areas are well lit I'm not going to go through every one of those, but as I say, we, we can share the presentation after um, after the session, and if people want to access that, then as I say, it is a really useful resource to, to look at and use. So we'd go to the next slide. So what we wanted to do, rather than just Joe and I speaking to you for a long time, we thought we'd open it up to a bit of a, um, we're going to have a whiteboard um, for, for this little bit. Um, there's certain questions that have been posed by the British Geriatric Society and the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists in preparation for winter, thinking particularly about falls prevention um, and the restrictions that we've got. As Joe's mentioned, what we have seen during the, when people were shielding, that some people haven't been out of the, the houses for um, up to six months now. And with local restrictions coming back and the, the second wave of, of COVID being, being on us, um, there are concerns about making sure that people are safe and, and able to, to do things. So what I wanted to do here is this, this four questions here um, just really open up we're going to put a whiteboard up you that's there now you can literally just type on your screen on that with any thoughts and ideas in relation to these questions um, so I'll start with the first one is what additional provision do we need in order to meet the expected increased demand on full services over autumn and winter this year so one of the things that, that we've been talking about within Leeds is, is the, the connections that we've got with the third sector and people that um, are working with individuals living um, in the community. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got somebody already there, increased communi communi blob, communication channels. Um, and I think that is a big one. Um, one of the things that we have found that's been useful um, during the, the shielding period for people was um, third sector organisations who were making contact, but making sure that we were supporting those contacts with information and um, advice and guidance for the, the, the professionals um, who, who were making contact. So are there any other thoughts from any other areas regarding um, where the gaps are or what the needs are for, for winter. Encourage people to, to type in there. Don't worry, it doesn't tell me who's written it. Um, so don't worry about that, things like that. Please do join in. It's only because of the practicalities of having everybody off mute um, during these webinars that we thought a, a, a uh, whiteboard would be better. Okay. People are starting to type now. Do you want to come in if you want, Joe, as well? Um, increased digital access, yeah, that's a good one. Um, contacting a GP concerns about a patient in the community, yeah. How do we get a message out? Involvement of local community. I think the involvement of local community groups and services is crucial because they have the on the, gr on the ground contacts with some people that aren't necessarily known to um, professional services. Joint working with neighbourhood networks. Yeah, I agree with that one. I think that's a big, been a big, um, a big one that supported us in Leeds in particular. Do you want to add anything, Joe? Uh, no, I think you're doing really well, Sharon. <laughs> Thank you. Where to find Pathways Info? Yeah. What I'm going to do um, with all of these, we're going to save, I think we can save the whiteboard, can't we, Andy? Yeah, we can. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll save these questions and then feed them back into the Regional Falls Network um, as feedback for the, the, the staff that are dealing with falls prevention um, to, to consider going forward over winter. 
um, to just support offered by local authority digital teams. Yeah, I think some areas have got more infrastructure in relation to the digital offer than others. Um, one thing that we are doing within Leeds is um, investing in some additional iPads that we can um, loan to people that um, are at high risk of falls so that we can do some virtual one-to-one -one, um, support and exercise instruction. Um, I noticed somebody put leaflets on dehydration. Um, if that's a Leeds offer, what we have is the Leeds Malnutrition Prevention Hotline uh, Helpline. Um, and again, I can try and share some information on that um, because there is quite a lot of information um, available. Um, to support people and, and there are leaflets associated with that. Dehydration and malnutrition um, following COVID are big things that we're seeing in terms of admissions to hospital um, with people being readmitted, um, malnutrition particularly. So obviously the increased risk of falls is significant if we've got individuals that are um, dehydrated or malnourished. I was just going to say, Sharon, I think I'm just looking at some of the comments around kind of more physio input, obviously being a physio myself, um, I do appreciate that. I think we obviously really advocate the strength and balance exercise, so whether that's home or group based, but obviously there needs to be the resource out there to be able to provide it. And especially if we're going into winter um, with potentially more people falling, um, it's important to, to look at that and how we can respond to that. Um, and certainly a comment around, I think it says GPs being more responsive to concerns raised around postural drop and medication. And, and that, I think that, again, links in with the communications channels as well and how we can work um, together, given the fact that the GPs aren't seeing patients face to face as much. I've just realised I can't actually see all of the comments. I'm just scrolling sideways now because I've not seen some of those. Um... That's great. What I'll do is I'll people feel free to carry on commenting on that question. Um, but I'm going to move on to um, the, the sort of the other questions as well. So which parts of our local services can be delivered remotely using technology and which need to be delivered face to face? And I think Jo covered this one um, well in, in her in her slides. Um, that acknowledgement that we can't just move everything digital, um, but where we can support people people digitally that, that we try and, and do that um, but again that acknowledgement that not all um, older people want to embrace technology and um, making sure that we've got resources and information available in print format as well as um, electronic and digital solutions but just wanted to sort of pose that um, if there's any comments on what people feel that can be delivered um, remotely um, and which need to be delivered face to face. Sorry, I'm just going to ask a question. RL schemes. Sorry, what's RL schemes? Ah, retirement life. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, the, the restrictions are um, challenging. Um, and the rule of six, I think we still need to, to, to try and encourage activities of up to six. Um, I know that in the retirement life, some of the communal rooms were trying to be utilised um, in a COVID safe way. So I think, yeah, encouraging people. I think the, the thing with, with a lot of it is making sure that we're, we're targeting the social isolation aspect, because if people are socially isolated and become less active, um, then the risk of falls increases because of the, the combination of, of impact. So I think things like that are definitely crucial. And then the next question, how are we going to deliver, continue to deliver falls prevention interventions during further waves of COVID-19? Um, and, and some of that is that's down to um, down to us to come up with solutions as, as a region, really, and, and ideas and, and share information across. Certainly, one of the things, as I've mentioned, is is trying to get um, some activities done socially distanced, but one to one, socially distanced through um, digital solutions, but. Um, 
the ideal is to get people back into group-based programs, um, but we accept that that's going to take quite a long time to, to do because of the risks associated and the fact that a lot of people that are living with frailty are at a higher risk of the negative impact of COVID and flu. So is there any, if there's any co more comments? Am I missing any, Jo? No, not that I can see. And the last one, and this is this is to pose to, to people um, thinking about what you in your role can do and come up with with comments and suggestions that others in the, in the, in the session might find beneficial about how are we going to maintain or increase physical activity levels amongst all older people in your area. Um, and I think that is crucial because falls aren't an ine inevitable part of ageing. We can prevent them, but only by encouraging people to increase physical activity where the strength and balance is, is crucial. So any thoughts on that one? Keep the messages clear and consistent. Yeah, I'd agree. That has been the challenge during COVID. <laughs> Size programs make offers interesting. Yeah. One of the things that the feedback that we do um, do find from group based programs is the feedback of that social interaction um, and, and people find it fun because they, they build rapport during group um, group programs. So I think that's beneficial. Keep talking to people. Yeah. Exercise programs on TV. Just on the exercise programs on TV, um, just to let people know there are various resources. We've got them at the end of the slides. Um, but Active Leads, um, and I know other areas have done the same, other parts of West Yorkshire, have recorded some of the exercise instruction and put it on YouTube. Um, so people can access um, how to do some of the straight, basic strength and balance exercises and how to get back up off the floor. So again, there's some links at the end of this presentation. Um, and if people want information on any local offers, then um, I've got my email at the end of the presentation for people to, to email and I can direct it to whichever area is relevant, um, should there be any questions. Neighbour check calls, go through a checklist, yeah, yeah, eating, drinking enough, I think that, that one's quite a, a powerful one to use. Okay, is everybody finished typing? Have we got anyone still? Oh, I'm scrolling down now, I can, couldn't see all of them. Stop relying on digital and internet, very limited access for old people, yeah, I accept that. And, and we we have tried all areas um, across West Yorkshire have tried to um, develop information booklets to 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 meet that to that need. Um, okay, thank you for everyone um, for that. Um, it's been it's really useful, and as I say, I'll take that away and um, form part of the discussion for the next um, regional falls um, falls network. Um, people are still typing, so I'll just give it a second or two. Um, and if anyone's got any final comments to type in there, please do. Andy, can you see when all the typing's finished? Because I can't seem to see all of the screen at once. Uh, yeah, I can see a bit more. I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye on it and I'll save it once it's done. Okay, so have we got any more to add to the questions? I think we've got a few interesting comments and ideas there, and I think certainly communications coming out is a strong feature there, and certainly working across services and agencies um, in relation to what we can provide and support with the people going forward. Are we moving on to the question and answer section, Sharon? Um, yeah, I'm just conscious that I can still see people out. Um... Yeah, sorry, I've just got one. Typing, yeah. Yeah, creating timetables for exercises to be done, yeah. Anything that we can encourage people to get into a routine with exercise is really helpful. 
something that's going to be a prompt because obviously if they haven't got people particularly coming in as much as before that might have prompted them anything that we can do to support that is is going to be helpful focus online resources towards relatives of those vulnerable so they can support um, and continue support yeah i think that's um certainly in some of the, the developments that we've looked at um it, it's some of those messages and and some of those targeting actually um targeting the friends and relatives rather than some older people because of the the access to information sometimes and what's available in their locality yeah okay oh <laughs> still still people typing i don't want to <clears throat> don't want to stop um stop the flow I'll just give it a second more and then we'll move on to the question and answers I'm... fantastic thank you everybody um, for that bit we're just going to move on to the next um, the next bit is if you I don't know if it'll come up automatically for everybody but um, it's question if people have got any questions and we've got a question there where would we find the information on the falls pathway um, it would be helpful to know which um, area that is for is it if it's for Leeds or one of the other parts of West Yorkshire please if you can add that in um what is the best way to get the message out door to door um and should we be focusing on reaching out to relatives of those vulnerable to help them assist and educate family members i think um yeah the door to door information um again this varies across the across the west yorkshire region dependent on the support networks that are available but certainly most of the local authorities have engaged with third sector organizations in leeds we've got 33 hubs and um, that are providing support particularly through covid but also um, the neighborhood networks that we've got across the city um, what we've been doing with those is produ we've produced um, a staying well at home leaflet um, which includes information and advice on physical activity um, nutrition and hydration um, and, and things like that and we've um, distributed those to the neighborhood networks um, for them to, to try and get out to individuals as, as through the doors as they're having contact with them um, I know that Wakefield have done something similar with a, a very similar leaflet we've fo followed a very similar format but just changed it ever so slightly for the local areas um, and I think that is that when when we do falls prevention week normally we normally do activities in the community this year obviously it's very different because of um, restrictions so we, we focus this about the workforce and, and raising awareness with the workforce and access to information um, and we've put access to information that can be um, that is, is available publicly on the public health um, website that hopefully people will have um, a link to um, and I think that's where we can encourage um, people to, to access information to, to share with friends and family members Be anything to add on that one Joe? no no um, have we got any more I'm trying to scroll down I think the question in the answer to the falls pathway one was it was featuring leads right it's leads um we are just working on um reviewing the falls pathway at the moment um for leads um and we're we're going to be producing it shortly um so that will be shared obviously with health professionals and others referring in um as we finalize it over the next couple of months um but in in essence at the moment um, referrals to the specialist full service um, are done through a referral form Joe do you want to come in and answer um, yeah bit? so it would tend to be from certain healthcare professionals at the moment so our, our main referrals are through GPs the GP practices um, for anyone that might be more in neighborhood network schemes voluntary sector if you've got concerns about people in relation to falls um, I would say in the first instance just check if they're under any services already from an NHS perspective 
um, that might be able to do the false assessment. If not, I would be signposting to the GP um, and then they can make that referral if they feel that's appropriate. Um, yeah. To, yeah, thank you, Donna. Um, a lot of the neighbourhood networks have been doing um, things like that and having virtual coffee mornings and, and things um, with with Zoom and, and uh, Teams and things like that. I think the, the feedback that we've had from, from older people is that telephone contact has been really, really powerful and really important to them. Um, I held a workshop session yesterday and we were talking about carers and, and what can we do to support carers and people they're caring for through winter. Um, and those telephone contacts of not only asking um, the individual how they are, but actually asking the carer how they are and just somebody taking the time to, to check in on them um, actually makes a massive difference. And it sounds as though it's not just for falls. It's not. But if we think about people's mental well-being, um, the more positive they can be and the, the more likely that they're going to be to being active and engaging in, in activities, therefore, and um, preventing falls. So it sounds like a bit of a, a, a bit of an off-the-wall way of doing it, but actually engaging through different conversations um, can lead to quite more confidence and open discussions with people. One of the things that we do find is that a lot of people fall, but they don't tell anybody they've had a fall, um, particularly health professionals, um, for a variety of reasons. One of the, one of the ones being they, they don't want to um, they don't want to be perceived that they're, they're becoming more vulnerable um, that personal acceptance as well as the perceptions of what people will think or feel um, and I think the more that we can get people engaged in conversations and have asked that question over have you had any falls um, and, and looking at ways that we can be proactive um, are really important. Do you have anything to add on that Jo? No, no, I think, um, yeah, it's obviously really important that we uh, we are doing these assessments as early as we can and, and intervening and, and providing what we can with the services that we've got. But challenging times at the moment. Very challenging. Um, and, and I think that recommendation as well with the Chief Medical Officer, everyone over the age of um, sort of 40, 45 should be doing strength and balance. So again, <laughs> that acknowledgement that um, when, it, when it, we're all ageing, really, um, and it's how we age healthily. That's the the way that we're trying to approach it as uh, as a as a as well as a region, really. I think touching on your point though about some people not um, alerting people to the fact that they've had a fall and that it can be they've had quite a few falls before a healthcare professional is made aware of that. So if you do know of people that have had falls and they aren't kind of in the pathway then that would be flagging up to the GP because we need to look at that and see if there are any underlying medical causes for why somebody might be falling and what appropriate services need, do need to get involved as early as possible because if we think back to how it impacts on someone as a result of a fall and like how, where we were saying about assessing and intervening early because we want to kind of prevent that spiral of decline that can happen after one fall um, that's why it's really important that we raise awareness that get people communicating that they have had a fall and, and get the right people involved at the right time. Are there any more questions or any that have, haven't answered that I've missed? I'm just scrolling back up now. Or any general comments that people want to make? No? Okay. Um, if there are any more, just um, pop it in the question and answer box and uh, I'll, I will check it before we finish. Um, if we go back to the slides, for those who have actually clicked on the question and answer tab, if you click back on the presentation tag, it'll take, tab, it'll take you back. So what we've done here is just provide um, some more information on where additional information and guidance can be um, can be accessed um, and some of the references for the, the 
the content of the slides. Um, so the Fit for Frailty um, has guidance for old people living in the community in outpatient settings. Um, quite an interesting article is the um, Falls and Fear of Falling, which comes first. Um, and a, that talks about the, um, the full spiral that we refer to over that decline. Um, if people have got a fear of falling, actually, their risk of falling increases. So it's that uh, chicken and egg question sometimes. Um, the Falls and Fracture Consensus Statement, for those of you working with commissioners or working in commission services, there's various recommendations and guides within that document about good practice and what um, what should be available across um, services in an ideal world. The NICE guidance that uh, Joe referred to um, has the, the, the guidance for how to assess and um, look at the risk and prevention of falls. And there's a link there for the later life um, training guidance that um, Joe mentioned as well and um, the psychological theory to practical observations again another useful document for people to access um, to, to sort of understand how we can approach and how we can support people to prevent falls in the future go to the next slide there's some other resources here um, a lot of them are if you literally google those um, those those titles it will bring you up with so keeping well at home is the leaflet that um, leads have developed but there are um, local variations of that as well in other areas the Charter Society of Physiotherapists get up and go and um, that's some exercise instruction and the staying steady is the a leaflet that's how to um, how to prevent falls Make Movement Your Mission is a really good one to access as well during lockdown, as is the Get Up and Go one. Um, it's basically YouTube clips that are done um, three times a week um, for people to, jo to join in with an, in their own home um, to try and prevent falls, but just generally during lockdown um, and while people are isolating, keeping active. Um, it's targeted to older people, but um, I'd encourage others to, to look at it as well because it is very good. The Keep on Keep Up app is based on the um, FAME programme and PSI exercise instruction. What we're doing within Leeds is really promoting this app um, and investing, as I said, in iPads um, with the app installed on it to encourage people to do exercise at home to prevent falls. But it also talks about bone health and it also talks about home hazards. Um, so it's, it's a really good app if people have, um, have got patients or people, service users, people are working with who have got access to um, iPhones or iPads. Um, there is a version being launched on Android shortly, but it's just being developed because it is going to um, look slightly different to the Apple um, approach. And there's various tools and rehab information there as well from the British Geriatric Society that have been developed. So they're national um, information. I've added a slide here um, for sources of information, particularly for leads um, and things that can be accessed. So we mentioned about the minor adaptations um, that's delivered through Home Plus service, which is care and repair. Um, and there is a video on how to prevent falls that we, that we produced. Um, when we originally planned this session, we were hoping, if we go to the next slide, um, so this is the last slide. Um, we're hoping to have a panel with representatives from each part of the region on this call. Um, but unfortunately, because of the pressures that COVID is presenting to us at the moment, um, we've, we've not been able to facilitate that. Um, so if people have further follow-up questions that may be specific to a particular geographical area or general questions that they've not been able to raise in the question and answer session or in the whiteboard, um, my email is there please feel free to email me um, and I can either forward those queries on to the relevant um, member of the, the Falls Network or um, respond to them myself if, if the lead's specific. Um, I'll just double check back on the QA board and see if there's any additional questions. 
Oh, that's a good point, Donna. Um, yeah, we do have neighbourhood networks um, and they do keep regular contact with people, particularly during COVID. Um, so if you have somebody that you're concerned about living in the local community, it's not necessarily a, a clinical issue, but it's more of a, an isolation issue or general support, you can refer to the neighbourhood network um, and they will engage and, and make contact with them. And similarly with other parts of, of the region. Um, they have similar schemes. So that is the end of the session for us. Um, I hope it's been useful for people. I hope you've enjoyed it um, and it's been insightful. As I say, if there is any follow up um, for either myself or Joe, feel free to email me and I can redirect them. And thank you very much for taking part. And please um, access the other information and resources that are available as part of Falls Prevention Week. Thank you. Everyone have a good weekend. Thank you.